I'll talk a little bit about freshwater mussels. Um, Alan used to be my, my supervisor when he worked for Fish and Wildlife Service, and um, he always liked to joke about calling freshwater mussels rocks with guts or brown rocks. And um, so I always had to listen to that. But actually, freshwater mussels are, are very fascinating organisms. They are the most, um, freshwater mussels and snails are the most endangered group of organisms in North America. And they're primarily restricted to the southeastern United States. That's where the center of biodiversity is for freshwater mussels. Um, Arkansas has the greatest number of species west of the Mississippi River. We have um, right now 81 species. Um, that number's climbing due to a lot of genetics work. And so we're finding that um, a lot of species that appear to be morphologically very similar um, are actually are distinct species genetically. Um, so who in here likes to fish? This is a question I always like to ask kids when I talk about endangered species. And Okay, and I got at least one or two. So I'll see a few more. Get a few more over here. We'll, try to get, we'll get a few people to raise their hands. Um, usually the kids, about three quarters of the kids raise their hand and then the next question is, is, is how many people know that freshwater mussels also like to fish? Oh, I got one hand back here. Oh, two. Uh, must, must be some science-related people back hanging around back there. <laughs> um, it's funny, though, because the kids, they'll, three quarters of them will have their hand up, and then the other quarter will go up, and so everybody, you know, knows that mussels like to fish. But <laughs> they, um, They've actually, um, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating evolution because for an animal that spends most of its life in the same spot or within a few feet of where it dropped off as a juvenile, um, it's, it's pretty neat because um, freshwater mussels, they require fish to complete their life cycle and, and some species are generalists and they, and they use a whole lot of different fish, probably just about any fish you can think of. And then there's other mussel species that are specialists that only use one or two species and they've developed these very fascinating lures and and different species have different lures to attract these fish and they mimic different things there's um, one there's one group of mussel species that has a lure that actually kind of it's kind of like hook and line lure that where it has this conglutinant sac that's full of all these glochidia that are like small little larval mus mussels and and it's dangling this lure um, out in the water column and, and that attracts the fish and when the fish tries to eat it then all those little glochidia are released and they're parasitic on the fish either on the gills or the fins depending on the species for anywhere from a week to a month depending on the species and then wherever the fish happens to be when the glochidia mature into juveniles they drop off and if it if the habitat's suitable, then that's where they end up spending most of their life. If it's not suitable, then they die. Um, but um, and then there's a there's other mussels that that mimic um, aquatic insects, and um, some have mantle flap ad adaptations that um, you could actually take like a, a minnow and put it in an aquarium next to the mussel female as she's displaying. And it's got a little eye spot and everything, and and if you didn't know the difference, you really, unless you really took a really close look, in a lot of situations, you wouldn't be able to differentiate between the mussel and the mussel lure, the mussel's lure and the fish that it's trying to mimic. Um, so it's it's amazing how they've adapted to to mimic these other fish in their in their environment. Um, and there's another species that, that we're working a lot with here in Arkansas. It's the winged maple leaf. We have the, the largest population left in the range um, in, the, in South Arkansas in the Saline River. And we're currently working on um, using females from the Saline River to, um, to do a reintroduction work over in the Duck River in Tennessee. So we've um, brought catfish in from the Duck River um, to research facilities up at Missouri State University and uh, we're using our females to propagate and eventually hopefully we'll be able to reestablish a population that's been extirpated from the Duck River for about 80 years. Um, 
and and that, that species is a specialist that um, at, only uses channel catfish and blue catfish, and it's um, when we were, when we were first were trying to figure out what the host fish was and, and when the females were grabbed, it was it took us years because we've got about a two week window every October that's temperature dependent to collect grabbit females, and if we miss that window. Um, you know, we have to wait a year to try again. And, and when we first found the females grab it, they looked like they were all dying. And they had this little gray flesh sticking out the top that kind of looked like a volcano erupting, but it was just kind of looked like dead rotting flesh. And, and the females were gaping open, which is not a typical behavior. And they looked just like mussels that were dying. And so we were really concerned about our females and, and what was going on. And they wouldn't react, they wouldn't, you know, usually with the lures, that they're real sensitive to fish touching them and they quickly release their glochidia. Well, these females, you know, we're, we're touching them and they won't release any glochidia and we're, you know, we messed around with them for, for a while and finally tugged on one hard enough that she released and we realized, oh, um, you know, they're, because of the, the host fish being catfish, um, they're actually trying to mimic a dying muscle and we don't know whether there's any odor that's put off or not but um, that's that's how they attract these these catfish 